Yeah, can you all um, can you all see my presentation there? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great. All right, so um, you already introduced me, so I'll skip this. Um, so my presentation is titled uh, Muchos Tacos, Pocas Mushes. Don't worry, you don't have to speak Spanish. Um, so uh, the paper I'm presenting was originally a term paper for a seminar titled, uh, for a seminar taught by Dr. Shama Rangwala, who has in fact just taken up a position as an assistant professor at York University. Uh, so in this seminar, we spent a great deal of time focusing on Frederick Jameson's The Political Unconscious, unconscious and his conceptualization of the ideology of form, quote, to determine the contradic contradiction of the specific messages emitted by the varied science systems which coexist in a given artistic process as well as in its general social formation. Now, I must admit that I wasn't too thrilled by the concept at first, but Dr. Rangwala also introduced us to Roderick Ferguson's aberrations in Black and his methodology of a queer of color critique which employs cultural forms to bear witness to the critical gender and sexual heterogeneity that comprises minority cultures and interrogate social formations as the intersections of race, gender, sexuality, and class with a particular interest in how those formations correspond with and diverge from nationalized ideas and practices. Um, more concretely, he focuses on the African-American novel and juxtaposes it to the canonic to canonical American sociological texts. Uh, so Dr. Raguala presented Ferguson's method as, uh, as evidence of the portability of Jamisonian critique uh, indeed, Ferguson calls critics to use this method to look at other uh, different histories of women of color and queer of color critical formations. So I set out to perform a similar analysis of a different queer of color history as recorded in another cultural form. Um, so in short, my paper was a queer of color critique of Canesta, but you know, what is Canesta? Um, so Canesta is the third episode of Netflix's award-winning um, Tycho Chronicles. Psycho Chronicles, which is a documentary series or docu-series, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, but first, each episode is uh, each episode focuses on a variant of the taco, and uh, through this lens, audiences access the lives of the people engaged in the material of production and consumption of the featured um, dish. But why canasta? Well, uh, as the synopsis states, the episode revolves around basket tacos, which is a variant of the taco, and audiences get to know the street food uh, favorite through one of its most dynamic purveyors, Lady Basket Tacos. Now, Lady Basket Tacos' uh, real name, Marvin, is a Mexico City-based culinary artist who identifies as Mushe, a third gender identity traditionally recognized among the Zapotec people, indigenous to Southern Mexico. Now, as sociologist El Miranda writes, Mexico is traditionally described as a, Mexi as a macho dominated society. So I found the focus on a non-heteronormative individual very intriguing. Furthermore, in May of 2020, Canasta won the James Beard Foundation Media Award for Best on Location Television Program, which speaks to the episode's cultural momentum. So my research question was, how are Marvin's racial and sexual identities recorded and constructed in and by this cultural form? Well, to begin, I researched the form. Uh, because the documentary the docu series is, of course, a multi-episode documentary, Pooja Rangan's dissection of the documentary, Immediations, was an invaluable resource. Um, she argues that the documentary is historically tied to notions of the immediate, a direct relation or action between two things or persons that can't be spatial or temporal. And she identifies a number of audiovisual tropes that solidify the medium's claim to immediacy. Most troubling, however, is that she finds that disenfranchised humanity is repeatedly enlisted and com commodified to corroborate the, docu the documentary's privileged connection with the real. Uh, one of my findings was that the commodification of the disenfranchised is present and appears to be amplified by the conditions of possibility and production of numerous docu-series, including Tycho Chronicles. Why is this? Well, Tycho Chronicles is a Netflix original. Nominally, this makes it an American production. However, it is, it is uh, narrated in Mexican-Spanish dialects. And this is reflective of what Louis Brennan, writing for the Harvard Business Review, calls Netflix's exponential globalization strategy, which consists of using country-specific knowledge to create productions that are both local for global and local for local. Now, I would argue that this is also tied to another peculiarity of the docu-series, which is that the first person narration in the documentary in Taco Chronicles is, per is a personified taco. Each episode's taco narrator is bestowed with a personality and accent that reflect its culinary and social cultural background. Thus, the taco operates as an intermediary whose authoritative voice modulates audiences' access to Mexico's history, culture, social formations, and mythologies. And this narrative strategy pushes the creative boundaries of the form and seems to defer what Jameson calls the problem of representation, which is essentially a narrative problem, a question of the adequacy of any storytelling form or framework in which history might be represented. So in other words, I would argue that the program seeks to mute challenges to its storytelling and representational adequacy. 
uh, by aligning with tacos and by extension of the culture that produces them to construct themselves in the show. So this begs the question of how does the taco construct itself? And I would argue that it does, it, it constructs itself as a working class staple. Uh, certainly this is done through the voiceover narration that I talked about before. Uh, subtly at first with lines such as, quote, I am never alone, I am never still around as the city gathers. But by the end of the episode, there is no subtlety and the taco declares itself the humble monument honoring working class breakfast. Uh, this self-construction is also reinforced through particip participatory testimony from experts and from vendors and consumers. And of course, imagery uh, plays a big part uh, as it connotates labor through, through, through shots of bustling bodies and vehicles in urban and at time precarious settings, and most significantly bicycles loaded with the baskets in which the techos are transported. That's just a summary of what I just said. Um, and it is in this context of working class unity and economic participation that Marvin is introduced in the final third of the episode. Uh, meaning the program largely constructs her identity by way of a dialogue between her capitalist participation in the working class and social media economies and the visibility of her non-heteronormativity. And this is done through establishing shots that situate her and her labor, one of the country cap country's capital's most marginal areas. Um, there are also lots of images of her and her family preparing tacos uh, in fact, this makes up most of the segment of her segment in the episode. And even her testimony initially focuses mostly on the viral origin of her name and fame through a chance encounter in which she was recorded selling tacos at a pride parade. Now, it is only after her participation in the country's economy is cemented with the tacos as mediators in this participation that the intersection and interplay between her indigeneity and non-heteronormativity are explored only briefly and from the confines of her bedroom. Marvin explains, quote, in Hoshi Hujitan, Oaxaca, there, there are mushes. We are talking about the third gender recognized in Hujitan. It is a word derived from Zapotec, meaning woman. It is a blessing for the family to have a mushi at home because these are people who have both spirits. Now, although Mar Marvin's account is in no way incorrect, it should be noted that very little is said about Zapotec people in Mushininity and that there is no direct acknowledgement of her identifying as either. Instead, Marvin te Marvin's testimony takes a nationalist turn when she states that, quote, I love my Mexico, our traditions and our culture, and I'm delighted to be able to wear all this so that people can get to know our culture, our traditions, and gastronomy, which is the best thing that we have in Mexico. This led me to conclude that, that Canasta um, and the episode's audiovisual layering construct Marvin, constructs Marvin as a heterogeneous individual who has gained social acceptance through her economic production and participation. Put differently, basket tacos are constructed as a mediating and unifying symbol of Mexico's working class, to which Marvin is now identified as a worthy participant in the country's national economy. Now, there are two problems with this. Um, first is that the episode obfuscates the intricacies of mushininity, indigeneity, and non-heteronormativity in Mexico, and exploits these identities to construct a working class narrative of representational progress. And second is that the narrative's construction of Marvin's identity reproduces the ideology of mestizaje. Now, what do I mean by this? Let's talk about the first one. While well, in Ferguson, I looked at sociological texts to find out more about missionity. Now, I knew that the Zapotecs are just one of over 60 ethno-linguistic indigenous groups in Mexico, and that my country's understanding of indigeneity is modeled by exogenic historical, social, and legislative views informed by generalization and prejudice. What I didn't know is that missionity is a multifaceted identity too complex to fully explore here. Although I will read a few words from Mushi anthropologist Lucas Avendaño who states that uh, mushininity is, quote, a total social formation. A mush is a child who is born with a male reproductive system, a male, but who culturally assumes affective, sexual, emotional, and labor roles that are not masculine. It is a concept that does not, exi does not exist in itself, but only in relation to the existence of its Western other's masculinities and femininities, and only within a cultural ecosystem that supports mushininity that is neither punitive nor restrictive relative to a person who is beginning to show a mushy characteristics. Elsewhere in the country, when this occurs, the child is sanctioned. As for mestizaje, what I meant uh, is what anthropologist Federico Navarrete describes as, quote, a racial and nationalist doctrine developed by numerous intellectuals in the late 19th century that became the official ideology of the Mexican state in the 20th century. Now, in theory, it called for the voluntary adoption on behalf of indigenous peoples of the central element of a national culture defined as the country's majority mestizo culture. In practice, however, as Mexico sought a capitalist economic development for the country, it became a process of cultural and identity substitution pushed forth by the state with the explicit end of integrating indigenous peoples and forcing them to migrate to cities where budding industries employ them as workers. Its institutionalization continues today. And as cultural theorist Christina Sue writes, 
Uh, viewing, viewed through the lens of nationalism, there is ample motivation for Mexicans to reproduce mestizaje as it fortifies their national ident identities. We can see then how Netflix's reliance on local knowledge would facilitate its reproduction in Tecco Chronicles. In conclusion, my paper found that Tecco Chronicles constructs Marvin's, Marvin's identity in a way that conforms to rather than, subvert, that, rather than subvert Mexican normativity, perpetuating the erasure of indigeneity and indigeneity in favor of a homogenized working class narrative. I hope, however, that works like Ferguson's will continue to draw audiences and critics alike to interrogate how heterogeneous populations are recorded and represented in cultural forms. Thank you.